Hi, welcome to the fall uh, Macmillan Stewart lecture series, fall uh, iteration. Uh, I'm Lerna Ikmekcioglu. I am a I'm history faculty here, and I'm the director of the Women and Gender Studies program. Um, today we have, like, what we have today is both part of the articulating abortion series as well as the Macmillan Stewart lecture series. So Macmillan Stewart lecture series are a distinguished uh, lecture uh, series that are biannual. They are on a topic that pertains to women in the developing world. Uh, by developing world, we understand the whole world. We have <laughs> it's the way that endowment was funded. Mm -hmm. That phrase comes from like 15 years ago, way before my arrival here. I am the chair that I hold the Macmillan Stewart chair. That's why I organized the Macmillan Stewart uh, lecture series. But given that Dobbs happened in the June of this year, uh, we decided at Women and Gender Studies program to really dedicate all of our intellectual energies to the question of abortion. And uh, we have created this articulating abortion series with the goal of looking at the topic of abortion or reproductive justice, but specifically the question of the termination of pregnancy from different perspectives. We already had two talks that uh, covered the topic through a philosophical lens and a visual art and representation perspective. Today we have someone who will give us a historical background in a different part of the world as to how abortion policies change when were implemented and the ways that they affected others. And we have two other talks coming up this term. I mean, and we have, we are so passionate that we arranged <laughs> three talks of this whole series at the end of like November to mid-December, during which everyone is deadly busy, <laughs> including <laughs> us. But we are, we are really committed. I, it, is, it has to be priority. And next Wednesday, we have Kiara Ridges with us, who will be talking about race at the Jackson Court and the implementations of Dobbs from a uh, racial justice perspective, as well as transgenders. Okay. And then on the 13th of Z December, we have Zekia Luna, who will join us once again to talk about racial okay. implications of not just Dobbs, but historically, even Thank historically, the, the, so the very mechanisms that that uh, governed usually female reproductive uh, choices. Now, today we are really very fortunate to have Suzanne Clausen uh, with us. Um, she will be talking about abortion in South Africa during the apartheid she is the she's she wrote the only book on abortion in africa anywhere in africa from what historical monograph historical to my monograph, knowledge it's still the only it's one it's the only one yeah. still the only one the book was published in Probably. 2015 right yeah. yeah so just a little bit background on uh, dr clausen she received her phd in history from queens university in canada um, she is now a prof the professor. She's the Julia Gregg Brill Professor of Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies at the Pennsylvania State University. So she transferred from Canada to the United States only in, only like two years ago. Just right? under two coming up two years. Coming yeah. up two years. Just during got my COVID. green card. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, her research and teaching interests include the politics of fertility in Southern Africa, nationalism and sexuality, and transnational movements for women's reproductive rights and justice. She is the author of a 2004 book titled Race, Maternity, and the Politics of Birth Control in South Africa, 1910-39. to And then in 2015, Oxford University Press book titled Under, Apart Under Apartheid, Nationalism, Sexuality, and Women's Reproductive Rights in South Africa. This book won the Women's History Prize awarded, awarded by the Canadian Committee on Women's History and the Joel Gregory Prize awarded by the Canadian Association of African Studies. She has published numerous articles about the, uh, the topics that pertain to Africa and reproductive rights. 
And she is currently writing a monograph on the South African Immorality Amendment Act of 1950 that criminalized sexual contact between whites and people of color. Thank you so much for being here. The floor is yours, Susan. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Lerna. Well, I want to start by thanking uh, Professor Lerna Ekmekjolu for the honor of being invited to give a Macmillan Stewart lecture and Angela Camacho de Souza for organizing all the logistics. Um, and I want to thank all of you for coming here tonight. It is always a great pleasure for me to share with you some of my research findings on the history of abortion in modern South Africa. And here's my outline for the talk. I'm going to give a very brief history of abortion up until 48. Then we'll talk about abortion under apartheid, which was 48 to 1994. And then I'm going to end with a comment on abortion after apartheid, um, thoughts that came to mind in the wake of Dobbs, which I thought might be an interesting way to um, bring together some themes that I'll be touching on during my talk. So um, number one, OK. So for centuries, abortion uh, was criminalized uh, for centuries, abortion was criminalized in South Africa, first in common law and um, then since uh, 1975 in statutory law. The criminalization of abortion was not an in indigenous development to South Africa or anywhere in Africa. It was a colonial imposition. Before the arrival of Europeans in the 17th century in South Africa's case, abortion was one of a range of methods of fertility control employed by the indigenous African inhabitants of Southern Africa. And the process of procurement was governed by customary law and often regulated by families. When required, miscarriages were induced by ingestion of an array of herb herbal abortifacients and other concoctions. When European powers colonized Africa, they imported and imposed their pre-existing metropolitan ideas and laws in relation to abortion. In effect, abortion law was an extension of the law in the home countries of the imperial powers. In the region that became South Africa, colonization uh, occurred relatively early for the, uh, for the continent, as I said, in the 17th century, starting when the Dutch East India Company established a refreshment station at the Cape. The British took over company rule in the late 18th century, after which numerous Boers, descendants of the original Dutch settlers, left the Cape and went north, uh, where they created two republics the Orange Free State and Transvaal. Both the Boer republics and the two British colonies in the region followed a combination of Roman, Dutch, and English common law that prohibited abortion, defined as deliberately induced miscarriage, except to save a woman's life. Regardless of colonial law, however, and of course, indigenous, enslaved, and settler women induced miscarriages, with settler women at times learning methods from indigenous women. In the 19th century, settler women also turned to midwives and doctors for secret assistance. By the turn of the 20th century, the development of new antiseptic techniques led to the predominance of surgical abortion, legal or otherwise, for settler women who could afford it. Indigenous African women, other women of color, and poor white women continued procuring the services of traditional healers and untrained abortionists, or else induced miscarriages themselves. In 1910, the Boer republics and British colonies amalgamated to become the Union of South Africa, with the names of the previous states now becoming the names of the provinces. South Africa employed racial segregation um, from the start and continued following Roman, Dutch, and English common law, again, uh, prohibiting abortion except to save a woman's life. Indeed, its legal status remained fundamentally unchanged until the 1970s. Evidence of clandestine abortion in the first few decades after Union in 1910 is sparse, which is unsurprising given how carefully women and abortionists hid their illegal actions. Typically, clandestine abortions came to light only in catastrophic cases, such as severe illness or the death of a white woman, or because doctors reported transgressive medical colleagues to police events that prompted punitive action by the courts and or medical authorities. 
1948, the South African state was captured by the Afrikaner National Party, which was the political embodiment of extreme Afrikaner nationalism, responsible for radically expanding the system of racial segregation. They did so by implementing apartheid, the white supremacist national policy of quote unquote separate, de separate development of so-called races that existed until 1994. Under apartheid, all people were officially categorized as one of four races, African, colored, meaning mixed race, Indian, or white. The regime referred to anyone of color as a non-white, which was an offensive term to people of color. And during this talk, I'm going to refer collectively to all people that the National Party um, considered non-white. I'm going to refer to them collectively as black. Now, apartheid means apartness in Afrikaans, which gives you a pretty good indication of what the policy was about. In a nutshell, people were separated along racial lines and races were placed in a hierarchy of value and power, with whites, who comprised only about 20% of the total population, at the top. Races were separated in a variety of ways. Geographically, meaning people were forced to live in neighborhoods that were designated by race. Politically, meaning only whites had the vote. Economically, uh, South Africa was sustained by an economic system dependent on exploiting black labor in the mines, on white-owned farms, and in white homes. And socially, meaning whites and blacks could not socialize, marry, or engage in um, extramarital sex across the white-black color, color line. In addition to being intensely racist, Afrikaner nationalism, the ideology of the ruling national party, was extremely puritanical and heteropatriarchal, a reflection of the powerful influence of Afrikaner's highly conservative neo-Calvinist churches. Thus, regardless of race, the national party opposed women having uh, control over their reproductive capacity and sexuality. This meant that under national party rule, South African law prohibiting abortion was technically race blind. At the same time, of course, race was fundamentally important uh, in determining women's abortion experiences. Race determined the methods women could utilize to circumvent the law, such that a black maid and her white madam, the term for white employer, from the same household facing unwanted pregnancy had very different options available to them. And their respective actions and experiences spoke to the profoundly different social worlds in which, that they inhabited. White women with sufficient resources procured safe medical abortions, performed clandestinely in doctor's offices or else in hospital under the guise of uh, appendix surgery as appendectomies. They also traveled to clinics uh, in Mozambique and overseas, and London uh, became the most popular destination by far after the passage of the Abortion Act in 1967. Poor white women sought assistance from numerous sources, including sympathetic family doctors and backstreet abortionists of various races and varying ability. In rural areas inhabited mainly by indigenous people, African girls and women continued turning to herbalists who sold muti, uh, traditional medicine, that was sometimes poisonous. Black women in urban areas utilize a range of extremely dangerous methods, such as injecting fluid into the vagina, which was risky because of the possibility of infection and or air entering the bloodstream and also inserting objects such as bicycle spokes or leaves, which could cause perforation or infection. The legendary singer and anti-apartheid activist Miriam Makeba, who was born in 1939 and grew up in Johannesburg, recalls how, quote, sick with, sick with worry, end quote, she became in 1949 when, at age 17, she discovered she was pregnant. She writes in her autobiography, my girlfriends get pregnant all the time. None of us knows about birth control. The girls drop out of school and have their babies. Some have abortions, but this is always dangerous. Many die because they try to perform the operation on themselves. 
In the 1960s, some black women in urban, er urban centers were becoming adept consumers of biomedicine who utilized services available at state-funded hospitals to safely complete miscarriages that they had instigated illegally in the community. In the community. Deliberately using a two-step method of abortion, they would somehow initiate a miscarriage, uh, and then, once bleeding was well underway and beyond the point of being able to be stemmed, they would present themselves at an emergency ward where a doctor could legally complete the abortion by performing dilation and curatage and providing antibiotics. In this way, biomedicine was perceived pragma pragmatically as a resource to be exploited as a defense against the patriarchal settler and customary laws that inhibited black women's ability to control their reproductive sexuality. But in many, likely most cases, urban black girls and women made unplanned trips to hospital because of botched abortion. Hospital records and testimony um, from doctors and nurses that I interviewed and, and many other sources reveal that for years the bulk of emergency care provided in gynecology wards was related to unsafe abortion and many girls and women died. Hospital statistics, eyewitness accounts, and evidence produced by researchers and reporters make it abundantly clear that pain, humiliation, and gruesome death were regular occurrences for black girls and women, as well as for some poor white women. During the first decade of apartheid, so the 50s, abortion continued to be largely hidden from public view, except for the occasional prosecution of an abortionist. But the situation changed dramatically in the 1960s when unsafe abortion became a visible social epidemic because women of all races started streaming uh, into emergency wards needing medical assistance either to complete miscarriages that they had begun or else for help with botched abortions. In the 1960s, at least 100,000 women were procuring illegal abortions annually, and the number spiked to an estimated 250,000 women in the 1970s, the vast majority black women, poor black women. By the late 1970s, likely one out of nine pregnancies was terminated illegally. The dramatic jump in numbers reflected the momentous socioeconomic changes that occurred in South Africa as a consequence of the ongoing appropriation of African homelands and steady unraveling of indigenous Africans' pre-colonial societies and related social norms. Steadily, Africans moved to the cities where uh, girls and boys were growing up without application of traditional social controls, including sexual regulation. Within the other race groups too, the effectiveness of patriarchal policing of female sexuality was weakening, and premarital sex, without knowledge of contraception, was becoming increasingly common. And as a result, girls and women of all races experienced unwanted pregnancy at unprecedented rates, resulting in turn in unprecedented numbers showing up at hospitals. The crisis in unsafe abortion prompted hospital administrators in the 1960s to publicly request additional resources from the state to cope with the inundation to hospital emergency wards, um, emergency uh, wards and gynecology wards. The increased visibility of abortion also spurred groups with disparate interests, including feminists, doctors, liberals, legal scholars, psychiatrists, the courts, and some churches, to demand law reform. This all really picking up pace in the late 1960s. Both the timing and the nature of South Africa's abortion controversy were heavily influenced by contemporaneous struggles for sexual and reproductive rights taking place in other countries, some of which succeeded in reforming patriarchal heteronormative sex laws. The legal victories that most inspired South African advocates of liberalizing the abortion law were England's Abortion Act of 1967 and later, in 1973, Roe v. Wade in the United States. 
Some organizations calling for law reform were respected influential bodies, such as the South African Society of Obstetrics and Gynecologists, the Planned Parenthood Association of South Africa, and the Whites-only National Council of Women. In addition, a small but very vocal and determined self-described pro-choice group emerged in the early 70s, the Abortion Reform Action Group, ARAG. The group was comprised of middle-class, English-speaking white women, and in the abortion controversy that ensued in the early 70s, ARAG deployed a combination of liberal feminist discourse, emphasizing choice, and public health arguments that had been effective in England and the United States. They also cited the need to address overpopulation, a discourse that reflected many white South Africans' anxiety over the rapid growth in size of the black population. Ultimately, <coughs> excuse me. Ultimately, ARAG failed to build a broad-based multiracial feminist movement for abortion law reform, which left them politically weak and easily ignored by the National Party government. By the early 1970s, constant criticism of the status quo made abortion law reform a pressing political issue. Yet, despite public pressure, the National Party government's stance on abortion was unequivocal. It was only permitted to save a woman's life, and they had absolutely no desire to intervene in the abortion controversy. This was regardless of the widely publicized um, nature of the clandestine abortion industry and a um, public, public, public um, publication in newspapers of the costs of unsafe abortion in the forms of women's lives and state funding for emergency care provided in publicly funded hospitals. If anything, given Afrikaner nationalists' perennial fear of what they call swamping, shorthand for demographic and political displacement of whites, again, a minority-sized population relative to blacks, um, yeah, their fear of being displaced by the oppressed black majority, the regime was probably very pleased that large numbers of black women were terminating pregnancies illegally. The clear correlation between unsafe abortion and high maternal morbidity and mortality among black women was of absolutely no concern to the regime which was wholly unmoved by reports of their suffering. The government was finally forced by the courts to reform the law. In 1971, two important court trials of doctors charged with providing abortions to white teenagers and unmarried young uh, white women, um, uh, where the verdicts revealed, the, there were verdicts in these two trials that revealed that there was a desire for law reform on the part of some members of the judiciary. In the first case, the state versus King, the judge reluctantly found the doctor, doctor guilty and in doing so went on to declare though, quote, there are several grounds on which it must be possible, end quote, to lawfully perform abortions, including when the woman's physical or mental health were, were seriously endangered by the pregnancy. And he also gave the doctor an extremely lenient sentence, a message in itself. The second case of the same year, State versus Van Druten, was the prosecution of a doctor who openly performed an abortion on a 15-year-old white girl who had been raped by her brother in order to provoke the police to arrest him. In this case, the magistrate acquitted the doctor, stating South Africans' views regarding the justifiability of abortion were changing and that it should be possible to legally perform abortions for reasons other than to save a woman's life, such as for example, when a woman's uh, physical or mental health was at stake. Now, this second case was sig uh, especially significant because the doctor's acquittal undermined the legitimacy of existing common law. The magistrate's ruling placed the South African medical profession in what critics called a confused and unsat unsatisfactory legal situation. And this confused situation effectively forced the National Party government to reform existing abortion law in order to clarify the grounds on which abortion was legal. 
Thus, it was not feminist agitation or concern for women's health, but rather medical and legal demands for law reform that ultimately pushed the National Party government to craft what would become the, the country's first statutory law on abortion. The National Party's decision to create abortion legislation occurred just as Afrikaner nationalists were becoming greatly alarmed by knowledge that young, unmarried white, uh, white girls and uh, women were having premarital sex. The increasing visibility of the flourishing clandestine abortion industry made this disturbing conclusion unavoidable. Clearly, the white daughter was evading the father's control of her sexuality which provoked anxious discussion within Afrikaner nationalism um, regarding the dangerous moral disease of what they called permissiveness that was infecting white South Africa. This reality undermined the ideal of the morally pure white woman that was a cornerstone of Afrikaner nationalism. It also, it also undercut the idealized image of the heteropatriarchal white Christian family that was used as a primary marker of white's supposed moral superiority and higher level of civilization relative to their black subjects, claims that helped justify white supremacy. Given the ideological importance of maintaining the myth of pure white womanhood, the National Party government seized this evil necessity of abortion law reform as an opportunity to buttress the barriers obstructing uh, young white women's access to medical abortionists, to doctors willing to perform abortions. And this they did in two ways. First, the regime set out to discipline white doctors who were illegally performing abortions on white girls. Um, thus, in the early 70s, uh, the state destroyed the careers of um, some very prominent as well as some not at all well-known but very well-meaning uh, family doctors in very high-profile prosecutions that were widely covered in the press. And the regime calculated correctly, as it turned out, that convicting a few white doctors would deter many others uh, previously willing to perform illegal abortions from doing so thereafter. Second, they would create a law so packed with obstacles that few white women would actually be able to access legal abortions. In February 1973, the government tabled the Abortion and Sterilization Bill. Now, this bill was modeled to a significant extent on England's relatively liberal Abortion Act of 1967, suggesting the National Party government initially left its design to senior bureaucrats in the Ministry of Health. This is the only reason I can come up with to explain how relatively liberal the initial bill was. Other similarities, um, there were many similarities, uh, including um, as you can see on the slide, uh, increasing the number of indications for legal abortion. Other similarities included an emergency clause that allowed a doctor perform, to perform an abortion without prior permission if, quote, he, and the word is he, is of the opinion, end quote, that if continued pregnancy would cause serious and lasting injury or disability to her physical or mental health, it would be permitted. The bill was immediately referred to a commission of inquiry composed of 10 senior members of parliament, all white men between the ages of 50 and 60 and most members of the National Party. The exclusion of women from the commission was unsurprising to observers given the misogyny of Afrikaner nationalism. In response to anger um, at women's exclusion um, from the commission, uh, one National Party member of Parliament exclaimed derisively in Parliament that, quote, if one wanted to abolish capital punishment today, surely one would not appoint a bunch of murderers to go into the matter, end quote. The Commission of, in of Inquiry, it transpired, was deeply worried about how thoroughly, quote unquote, moral decay had already penetrated white South Africa, as illustrated by the trials of doctors. Uh, providing abortions to white teenagers. And the, the commission concluded that the proposed bill was far too permissive. When the men submitted their report and an amended bill to Parliament in 1974, it stated in part, the commission report stated, 
your commission finds that the concept of abortion on demand is repugnant to the religious, moral, and ethical principles of the vast majority of the inhabitants of South Africa, white as well as non-white, and that it is unacceptable to the South African community, end quote. The commission was, quote unquote, overwhelmingly of the opinion that abortion should be available only in exceptional cases and under, quote, strictly con controlled conditions, end quote. The commission recommended a multitude of reactionary amendments, too numerous to recount here, that were ultimately adopted into legislation in 1975. Uh, just to list a few of the most egregious amendments that would be adopted the following year into law were the following. First, the new law separated physical and mental health indications for abortion in order that claims of serious mental, dis mental distress could be subjected to extremely rigorous testing. The quote, mere threat, end quote, of suicide should not be taken seriously. Instead, abortion should be permitted only in cases where continued pregnancy threaten, quote, danger of permanent damage, end quote, to mental health. These quotes are from the proposed bill, which is taken into law. So, um, yeah, only where continued pregnancy threatens, quote, danger of permanent damage, end quote, to mental health. And schizophrenia and endogenous depression were cited as likely the only two acceptable diagnoses. Two doctors had to certify the possibility of permanent mental damage, one being a state-employed psychiatrist to which rural women had absolutely no access. So this clause effectively denied a great number of African girls and women uh, access to legal abortions on grounds of mental health. Second were new and extensive requirements for responding to women's reports of pregnancy resulting from rape and third was the requirement that administrators who gave permission for abortions to be performed in health facilities include in their reports to government the names of the doctors who performed the procedure. Clearly, the legislation uh, proposed by the commission and ultimately um, accepted was designed to address what they considered two threats to the apartheid moral code, insubordinate white women trying to assert control over their reproductive sexuality and the doctors willing to assist them. The National Party tabled the amended abortion and sterilization bill that followed the recommendations to a T of the Commission of Inquiry. And the debate that ensued in Parliament in 1975 was beyond belief to even the most hardened critics of the government. Many comments made by National Party members of Parliament about teenage girls and women were racist and misogynist in the extreme. As just one example, one National Party uh, member giving a speech uh, said he would like to, quote, tell a little anecdote to add a light touch to my words, end quote, and then went on to tell this following joke. A young girl arrives at a hospital and asks for help. She says to the matron, oh mother, oh mother, I have been raped. Matron, please help me. The matron says, yes, come in my child, walk this way. Go straight through to the kitchen. On the shelf you will find a lemon. Squeeze out the juice and drink it. The girl then says, oh matron, will it really help me? And the matron says, yes, it will help to remove that smile from your face, end quote. Uh, a joke that elicited a great deal of laughter from other members of the government. So the National Party ultimately passes the Abortion and Sterilization Act in February 1975. Afrikaner nationalism's vehement hostility to even the faintest suggestion that abortion should be accessible for any reason other than to save a woman's life is, I think, a vivid example of the enmeshment of seemingly straightforward gender battles in much broader contexts of moral anxiety and political insecurity. To the National Party, if permissiveness were not curtailed, it would weaken whites' ability to withstand attacks on apartheid launched by enemies, both from inside the country and outside the country, enemies like communists who supposedly wanted to weaken whites' moral fiber in advance of invasion.
The Abortion and Sterilization Act 1975 made no racial distinctions regarding grounds for legal abortion. Nevertheless, it was a thoroughly racialized response to clandestine abortion, although not in the way critics commonly have assumed. Observers have er erroneously claimed that the law's overriding intent was pronatalist, that is, the National Party's motive for enacting the legislation was to increase the size of the white population by preventing white girls and women from having abortions. But the law's primary goal was not demographic. Otherwise, the regime would have attempted to eliminate the ongoing practice of white women terminating pregnancy with the help of non-medical abortion, backstreet and so-called abortionists, uh, which it rarely attempted to do after 1975, despite common knowledge that white girls were continuing to turn to the clandestine abortion industry. Also, the regime never tried to stop women traveling to London and elsewhere to obtain medical abortions, as was also common knowledge, nor did it ban married white women's access to the oral contraceptive, despite outcries dating back to the mid-1960s that the pill was contributing to white race suicide. Any numerical gains made by the white population as a consequence of this law were obviously welcome uh, from Afrikaner nationalists and other racist whites' point of view. But this was not the fundamental reason for its creation. Instead, the law's purpose was fundamentally ideological. It was a proclamation of apartheid morality intended to shore up Afrikaner nationalist ideology in white society and to curtail white society's drift towards moral decay. At the same time, and very importantly, the regime knowingly allowed the continuation of the social epidemic of abortion raging in black communities. Despite mounting indisputable evidence that a multitude of black women and girls were procuring clandestine abortions, often using far riskier methods than white women, the National Party turned a blind eye to their plight. I suspect the government was actually pleased by reports of black girls and women dying of unsafe, to, un, of unsafe abortion and therefore approved of the flourishing clandestine abortion uh, industry in black communities. And the reason for that inaction on the part of the government was multifaceted, including reluctance to spend additional funds on black women's health by providing abortions in publicly funded hospitals, also fear of antagonizing male African, African nationalists and other black men who resented state interference in quote unquote their women's reproductive sexuality. And I also think um, that this white fear of swamping um, was important because unsafe abortion helped curb black quote unquote overpopulation. Black women were essentially terminating pregnancies at relatively little financial cost to the state. As predicted by critics, the Abortion and Sterilization Act of 1975 was extremely harmful. The law further stigmatized abortion and had a great chilling effect on the medical profession. And it contained so many Byzantine bureaucratic requirements for women and doctors alike that obtaining a legal abortion became almost impossible. After 1975 and until the demise of apartheid, only a few hundred women, most white, obtained legal abortions annually. And meanwhile, the clandestine abortion industry thrived. In 1989, to give you just one example, a study reported that unsafe abortion accounted for 46% of total admissions in the gynecology ward at King Edward VIII Hospital in Durban, a hospital uh, for blacks. Uh, that was a total of five black women per day. To the National Party government, this was success. Today, abortion in South Africa, I'm just going to end now with a slightly different conclusion in the light of Dobbs. Today, abortion in South Africa is a right codified in law. Apartheid fell in 1994, and just two years later, in 1996, the newly elected African National Congress, the ANC government, passed the Choice on Termination of Pregnancy Act, the CTOP Act, as it's called, that explicitly promotes reproductive rights and, quote, extends freedom of choice 
by affording every woman the right to choose whether to have an early, safe, and legal termination of pregnancy. End quote. The law recognizes that the state, quote, has the responsibility to provide safe conditions under which the right of choice can be exercised without fear or harm. It's okay, it was the last slide. In addition, the CTOP Act is highly permissive by international standards. Abortion is essentially permitted um, upon request uh, during the first 12 weeks of pregnancy and from the 13th up to and including the 20th week of pregnancy, um, women can, pe pregnant persons can obtain uh, abortions for a, a host of indications. The CTOP Act has uh, rightly been hailed by women's health advocates around the world as legislation that fosters women's reproductive rights in stark contrast to the previous law that I've been talking about. Um, it was widely considered a huge feminist victory, as it was. However, many women, especially young unmarried women and teenagers of color, continued procuring clandestine abortions after 1996 when the CTOP Act was passed. And every year, thousands, tens of thousands, are still admitted to hospital with incomplete abortion. Women, especially young women, are continuing to turn to the world of clandestine abortion for help. So how do we explain the incongruity of the persistence and ubiquity of unsafe abortion in a country with such a superb legal framework? One major reason is the persistence of patriarchal norms and extremely conservative religious beliefs about women's sexuality in post-apartheid South Africa. The yawning gap between the letter of the law and accessibility of safe abortion in post-apartheid South Africa demonstrates that there are limits to what enacting progressive le legislation can achieve for struggles for reproductive rights and freedom. And here I'm thinking about the terrible situation phrasing, facing pregnant people uh, in the United States today, which we can discuss, discuss after if you like. So to conclude, legislative victory can be very important, though in Canada, where I'm from, we don't even have an abortion law. It's not in our criminal code. But as the case of the CTOP Act shows, the fight for safe abortion cannot be won by replacing egregious, hateful patriarchal laws with feminist legislation alone. Legal reforms are just one step, and not necessarily the most important step, in making safe abortion a reality. To fully succeed, the struggle for safe abortion must be enmeshed in a much broader campaign for social justice aimed at vanquishing misogyny, racism, poverty, and other scourges of inequality that prevent individuals from being able to act on their choices about their bodies, including but far from limited to whether or not to carry a pregnancy to term. Thank you. Thank you so much, Suzanne. Okay. Thank you so much, Suzanne. So we are now opening the floor for questions. We have about half an hour. Anyone wants to go first? If not, I'm going to. <laughs> Morning. <laughs> I, I have a lot of questions. But I guess the simplest one is this. So if the national party during the apartheid, obviously. If they were concerned about population, mm -hmm. uh, why would they not? Uh, it will sound naive. It has a background, but like, why would they not uh, make abortion legal for only black people? Uh, I, I know what you're saying. Um, I think I, I, I skirted over it quite quickly because it's it's it, there's a lot of facets to that. I think um, cost was a major factor. Um, at this time, in the 70s, the South African government was setting up uh, what they called Bantustans. They were setting up homelands, they called them, which were essentially um, um, sort of quasi-African states that were going to be on the border, some within white South Africa. And then 
black people, according to ethnic group, would be forcibly ro relocated back to their ethnic homeland. It was a, really a way of creating um, mini states as dumping grounds for black people who weren't needed for labor within white South Africa. That was their dream of grand apartheid. And there were a couple of um, groups that um, took the funding that the South African state gave them to set up their homelands, including homeland health care systems. And I think the state, the South African, um, the National Party state, wanted essentially for the homeland health care systems to ultimately give their own women abortions. They, they had this vision of black health care people providing abortions or anything for black uh, patients. Um, it would have still have been subsidized by um, the South African state um, because it was South African money to produce these fake um, African countries, Bantustans. Um, but as you can imagine, the amount of money given for health care um, for a black person was you know, minuscule relative to the amount of money put in investment for the medical care system provided for white South Africans. Um, so I think that was one part of their hope, their dream, that didn't come about. I think even within South Africa itself, they just didn't want to have to pay for proper abortions in gynecology wards. There were so many black girls and women getting abortions that it would have been, actually, there were even doctors that opposed um, uh, legalizing abortion for black girls and women because they were really afraid of their gynecology wards being turned into what they called abortion mills. And abortion was seen as kind of a lower level of medical care by some doctors. So they really just didn't want to see certain gynecology war wards in urban centers um, providing legal abortions for black girls. It would have been so expensive and so busy that instead, really, they were kind of getting it for free. I mean, yes, some girls were showing up to emergency care, which took money, but a lot of girls were dying or surviving completely on their own in black communities. There were no private hospitals? like For blacks? The, yeah, in general. Like, does it, I mean, why would legalizing abortion for a certain group has to be taking money from the public funds? Um, the the healthcare system in South Africa was uh, mainly a public healthcare system, but it was stratified, you know, according to race in terms of quality of care. Hospitals were segregated um, in the cities and in the countryside, where um, which was populated mainly by Africans. The the rural hospitals weren't very, you know, relatively speaking, as well equipped, but they were publicly paid for by the state or by mission groups. Although even missionary organizations, religious groups, were pushing back against the apartheid regime's racist policies. And so the, the regime even would take away hospitals from some religious-based bodies running um, free you know, hospitals, offering free health care for Africans. So I think part of it was strictly economic. Um, the, the economy of South Africa was steadily getting worse um, from the 70s on. South Africa was basically in a state of civil war certainly from the uh, 80s. You know, there was a national state of emergency from 76 onward. Uh, a lot of South Africa, um, urban South Africa was becoming ungovernable. Um, so I think it was economic, but I also think there was, you know, within black society, there was patriarchal values and norms and also uh, opposition to abortion and even birth control. And there were some anti-apartheid anti youth, male youth, that actually in Soweto in 76 and after um, targeted healthcare clinics and burned them or attacked them because they were providing um, birth control and abortion to black teenagers because they thought black girls should have babies for the cause. So, you know, female fertility was contested from different angles. And the state really didn't want to antagonize um, black men, I think, the sort of patriarchs within the black communities as yet another front, another front of the battle that they were having with blacks. Um, I think those are sort of my big reasons, my main reasons for why they just didn't want to make it legal for blacks or anybody. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Anyone else? Yeah. <laughs> 
Hi, uh, my name is Emily. Uh, thank you so much for your talk. I was wondering, um, since it was such a racist state and the whites were concerned about the purity of their race, was there incidents of forced abortion if uh, a white woman had was, was pregnant with someone from the wrong quote-unquote race? Um, to what extent was that practiced and accepted um, under apartheid? Um, I have never come across a case of a forced abortion because a white girl um, had a sexual encounter with a, with a black man. But there were definitely um, sort of homes for wayward girls. There were places where white girls were sent to have their babies, and those babies were um, sent out for adoption um, if they looked white. There is an untold story. I have a journalist friend of mine that says there were children born to white teenage girls and unmarried young women, or probably married white women as well, that um, went far away to have those babies um, in places run by um, missionaries. But I've also heard mention of probably state-funded by Afrikaner nationalists um, places where girls and women went to have those babies. Um, and uh, I have a colleague that says there's an untold story of all the, the ones that didn't get adopted because they didn't look white enough. Um, so um, I, have a, I have a colleague um, to, to back up. In the, when I was doing all this research and I was asking anyone to come tell me their stories about abortion because there's so much we don't know. You can tell I'm even pointing out now gaps in our, in our knowledge. Uh, one woman told me that um, she had a friend who was pregnant. This is a white woman and her friend was white. And she was pregnant and she thinks in 80, 81. And she went with her friend to look at one of these homes for sort of, you know, wayward whites. And it, if you went to that place to have your baby, um, you were provided free medical care and free accommodation. So that's what you got out of it if you were a poor girl that didn't have the resources, whose parents weren't rich enough to send you to England or wherever, right, to hide you. Um, but she said they walked through it and it was so puritanical and just so unfriendly. And the way they described it, it reminded me of the Magdalene Laundries. I don't know if you know the whole Irish story. Have you seen the movie Philomena? The woman next to you keeps nodding to everything I'm saying. So yeah, so she's very familiar with this history. I really recommend this movie, Philomena. It, it reminds me so much of the incredible misogyny and puritanism, um, puritanical judgmentalism within uh, Afrikaner nationalism towards white girls who they considered promiscuous for engaging in premarital sex. So that's a long way of answering your question. As a no, I haven't come across forced abortion, but certainly a lot of hiding away the shame of having a mixed baby. Even abortions, though, it was a classic story to say you were gonna go on, a, like on an art appreciation tour in Europe, for example, if you were a white family with money. Um, you know, we're going to go to England for the summer holiday, you know, and then there was such an industry of abortion um, in London for South Africans. It was, a, it was like down to a science. There were people to meet you at the airport, take you to clinics, waiting for you. You know, it was um, really, um, yeah, hundreds every year, which is why I say this was not about demography, this law. Um, yeah, so white families with money had many, many more options, but if you're poor white, I think you, oh, and of course there was a lot of infanticide as well. Um, a lot, meaning one's too many, but really de that's the measure of fertility control of the most desperate girls um, is abandonment or infanticide. And both were reported constantly in South African press. Today, at least in South Africa, um, in some places, like in, uh, I think it's Durban, there's a door of hope um, where a charity has set up kind of like a, a um, how to describe it. If you have a baby and you don't want to keep it and you want to anonymously, you can put it in a space, put a put it in and it's safe. And then on the other side, they can take the baby and you're basically handing over the baby and it'll be hopefully adopted or raised in a in a in a um, in an orphanage. But um, that's one intervention to prevent infanticide. Oh, and another, just one more story. Um, there's so many, I mean, we need so many more historians, but I also um, read in South Africa, gosh, this would have been 
let's say 2010, I was still doing research um, about some municipal workers in Johannesburg who were basically dealing with post-traumatic stress because they were the ones called to toilets that were being clogged in um, parts of Johannesburg where teenagers, girl, girls would go to have their, have their infants and, and leave. And I've seen, we were talking earlier about media, there's an amazing film, an American film, about a young white girl who does, does exactly that. And um, I can find the title for you later. I'm always looking for films that depict in a, an intelligent way what really happens out there, you know? Um, and so these men would have to go take these dead fetuses to unclog toilets and, um, you know, in desperate need of some kind of mental health care and weren't getting it, but yeah. So it's still not, not, not great what's going on. If I go first? Yeah. Okay. Hi. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yes. Hi, yeah. Um, thank you so much. That was so interesting. Um, I'm Chloe. Um, I'm going to ask a bit of a, an English law question, sorry. But I'm, I'm just really interested in um, some of the like obvious comparisons that jump out because they're happening at a yes. similar time. Yes. And one of the arguments that a lot of legal scholars make about the 1967 Abortion Act is that it was passed because the government was so embarrassed about de facto female resistance to the law. So it's so embarrassing for us that we are trying to ban abortion and all of these women are organizing and providing it to each other and they're dying and this is looking really, really bad for us because they are willing to die to circumvent our rules. And I was just wondering whether there was any sense of that narrative in South Africa, because it doesn't seem that there is, but it, but for a government that's almost as patriarchal as it is racist, I'm quite interested in the fact that they don't seem to have had the same concern about these women are just ignoring our rules, right? Does that make sense? It does, but I have to go back to your, your first comment about what you think was behind this 1967 Act. My understanding is, and I've done some research on this, in fact, I have a paper out right now under review somewhere, hopefully it'll get accepted, but, um, you know, there was, a f uh, there was a group called ALRA, you probably know, the Abortion Law Reform Association, formed in the 30s, the world's first organization formed just to liberalize abortion law, and it went right through to 67 and was part of ultimately bringing in that law. But um, if you read the m memoirs um, of the women who took part, like Madeline Sims is a very famous one who, who has written about, about this, um, as well as other scholars analyzing what happened, I think to put it in just simple terms, it was really what the medical profession wanted. The medical profession, um, for various reasons after World War II, became um, more open to, to performing abortions, but just as with midwifery, they wanted to colonize it. The doctors, the medical profession wanted to, to, to determine the reasons why a girl should have abortion. ALRA and other groups that were even more radical thought it should be on demand or really wide, open-ended, almost um, clauses that could around mental you know, mental to preserve mental health. Well, that's nice and broad, right? The medical profession really balked at a lot of the clauses that Alra wanted in the draft law, um, because they wanted um, basically they wanted abortion, uh, just like the South African doctors pushing for it in um, the late '60s and early '70s. They wanted protection. They wanted the government to spell out exactly when can they perform abortions, so that. They're, they don't have to worry about it. They don't have to worry about getting arrested. And they certainly also wanted to determine the, the conditions under which they would perform those abortions, for which reasons. So there was a real battle between the British Medical Association, which was very, very powerful, and a relatively small group like ALRA, um, the Abortion Law Reform Association. And it kind of comes to a head, and in the end, the British Medical Pro Association wins out. And that's including both sides actually also agreed on a eugenics law. That's the part that I'm writing about. But um, So that's a way of saying, I think that's the big reason behind why they passed that law. Like in South Africa, doctors wanted, they wanted everything very clearly spelled out so that they wouldn't get in trouble. And they also wanted to determine how it was done and under what conditions. Um, so that's actually a very parallel story. That's what happened in South Africa as well when I gave that... Um, the, those two trials that I mentioned, those two court cases, um, 
that's, that was a quote when I said it puts the medical profession in a confused and unsatisfactory situation. That's actually a, a quote, I like the phrase. Um, that's what the newspapers, newspapers were reporting that the medical profession was complaining about. They didn't like this. Okay, is it legal, is it not? Now this, this guy did it and he got acquitted and la la la. So um, the government brought in a law that was extremely clear and extremely restrictive. And most doctors were very unhappy about it because doctors are pragmatic enough to know it's going to happen. You know, abortion's going to be necessary. Um, and yeah, so in the end, in South Africa, the medical profession wasn't happy with the law. Whereas I think in England, for the most part, the medical profession was quite happy with the law. Yeah. So that, that's the first part of your question. And the second part was, how did the South African state feel about women that were subversive women? Why weren't they bothered by the fact that women were, like breaking the law is something that to a very patriarchal government full of men, if yes. women are ignoring them en masse, it's embarrassing. It's sort of at least one of the narratives that like Sally Sheldon in her book gives an account of that BMA story, but with this idea of like, hmm. The British Parliament just don't like women ignoring them, right? Unruly women, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Huh. yeah. Well, definitely the South African, uh, the regime were, was outraged that, that these young white women were having, you know, basically sex and abortions, um, you know, against the rule of the father, you know, it was a very patriarchal uh, ideology and government, etc. And there's a very famous, if you look at my book, like really one of the centerpieces of the book is this trial of a very prominent doctor named Dirk Crichton. He just died, aged like 100. Um, and he is like, he was a world famous doctor. He, he was like, in the, I'm, I'm not a medical person, but he was in the British Royal Society of something. And um, he was very well known for certain surgeries that he devised for women. And he was a medical professor, medical professor of gynecology and obstetrics at Natal University. And that made him automatically the head gynecologist and obstetrician running the gynecology and obstetrician ward of King Edward VIII Hospital that I mentioned. That was for Africans, African, um, you know, they also made hospitals for Africans, coloreds, and you know, everything had to be racially um, segregated. Anyway, um, Crichton was in cahoots with a self-trained abortionist, a working class man named Jimmy Watts, who um, taught himself how to perform abortions by reading about it. He was very safe, antiseptic, um, very, very careful, treated girls and women well. And Crichton was noticing girls coming in with botched abortion, many of them dying, but some of them coming in and everything was fine. And he wanted to know who's the one doing the fine. And he, he ends, finds out from a nurse, it's a guy named Jimmy, Jimmy Watts. Long story short, the two kind of go into business together where um, a girl wants an abortion, goes to Jimmy, Jimmy sends them to Crichton for antibiotics so they can first be on antibiotics, go back to Crichton, uh, with Jimmy. Jimmy sparks the miscarriage. Once bleeding is really well and underway, so it can't be stopped, then go to the hospital and Crichton would finish it or go to his clinic and he would perform the DNC, which was technically legal, right? So word got around that they were doing this by the hundreds, you know. So the government destroyed him, his career. They put him on not one but two trials in 72 and 73. Both times he was convicted, struck off the medical register. But the point of my story is they hunted down these young women by the dozens. They gave the, the, lead, the lead cop was a guy named Dan Matea, and I interviewed him. He admitted it. He had limitless funds on the part of the state to travel, to find teenage white girls that had had abortions so that he could bring them into court forcibly, haul them into court and uh, force them to give testimony in exchange for immunity about the fact that they had participated in this, 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 this whatever you want to call it, system. And the way those girls were treated on trial by the state prosecution was absolute slut shaming. So there you really see the state lashing out at girls that dared, you know, to have sex and then have the nerve to go see Jimmy, who I also uh, know, um, you know, these two guys that were helping out, you know, these teenage and young white women. They were, and the girls, you can see in the photo, you know, there's photographers and they're trying to cover their faces. They, they're, sometimes their names were reported even though they were told they wouldn't be. They were, 
Ricky Solinger, a very famous American historian, she, she came up with the term crypto porn, uh, which is interesting if you want to look into it. And that's absolutely what it was. It was very titillating. They forced these girls to talk about their sex lives and their genitals, which was an absolute form of punishment in and of itself for their wayward, unruly sexual behavior. And I'm sure that happened in other, other cases Although one immediately comes to mind of the opposite. I, I interviewed a lovely family doctor who was taking pity on poor white girls doing abortions and he got caught. And the girls on the stand wept for him, you know. They said, oh, Dr. Saville, he was so nice. It's our fault. We asked him to do it. And they were 15, 16 year old white girls. And he was convicted and struck off the medical register. And um, I don't remember those girls being slut shamed. I just remember them begging for Saville. So, yeah, it's just heartbreaking, some of these stories. That's a very long answer to your question. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, first of all, thank you for this. This has been great. Um, my name is JD. I'm a first year uh, sociology PhD student at Northeastern. And I've got two questions. One, did uh, framing of uh, access to abortion or reproductive rights more broadly play a role in um, white nationalist opposition to the end of apartheid as apartheid was ending? Was there any rhetoric around that? Did it play a role? And two, you mentioned the Abortion Reform Action Group um, using choice as one of the frames. Yep. How influenced were South African groups by other groups and the debates going on in the United States, in the global north, uh, in Europe? Mm. So I'm going to start with the second one because the answer is hugely um, there's two main white women who were behind AREG, one in Cape Town, um, and she came through this country in 70, 71, just as Roe was starting to work its way through the courts, totally inspired, went back to South Africa with um, feeling really pumped up by what feminists were doing here um, to get um, Roe up to the Supreme Court. Um, and the other woman, her name was June, I think she's still alive, June Cope, she was actually uh, English originally, moved to South Africa as a young woman and married a South African and stayed and had, I think, two sons. And um, together these women basically form AREG. And June Cope brings with her, um, well, she actually travels to England, back to England, and meets Mad Madeline Sims, this leading English um, um, pro-choice activist. And she takes back to South Africa very much the um, ALRA ideology, the Abortion Law Reform Association that I mentioned earlier that was started in the 30s and carried on. Um, so she brings back um, English ideas, discourse. She even saw Ereg, South Africans group, South Africa's group as like a chapter of ALRA. I found a photo, I have it in my book of them, um, five white women from Alra and maybe one there was they were always trying to recruit women of color so they could look more diverse I think there might be one black woman in this photo but they're holding a, a poster or a banner in solidarity um, with Alra which was under attack by some anti-abortionists back in England so I think she actually saw them as an extension of the British organization and then you had Dolly Maester the other woman in Cape Town bringing American ideas. So it's very much a transnational story. And I bet you there's a million other cases like that of um, middle class, illiterate women who either traveled or were closely following. Doctors were following liberalization of abortion laws happening everywhere from Romania to Japan. You know, like they saw what was going on and wanted South Africa to kind of keep up, you know. So it's very much a transnational story, including the, the pro-choice movement for sure. Um, and then your first part, the white nationalist movement. Um, you mean the ultra right whites, like the what were they called? The U B the sorry, which groups? The, and, and, the, um, I also can't remember the acronyms or the names. Yeah, there's yeah, there's the kind of like almost like a neo-Nazi group that emerges yeah, with weapons right and wing white nationalist yes. in opposition. Um, um, they don't want to settle with the ANC, yeah, right? They, yeah. Opposition to their clerk's efforts to settle with the ANC right. and everything else. And I was just wondering if in their framing of opposition to the end of apartheid, did uh, reproductive rights, abortion, or more broadly, the sexuality of white women play a role in how they discussed the threats mm. of um, 
that majority rule. Exactly. Right. I've never had that question before. That's really interesting. Um, I don't know. Uh, that's the that's the honest answer, and it's finally a short answer. Um, I really don't know. The coverage I've seen of that ultra right movement. Um, I don't remember abortion or women's rights or anything like that explicitly mentioned, but it may, maybe it was, but I, I don't know if it was a predominant facet. It was much more they wanted a homeland, right? They wanted to opt out of this new you know, d democratic South Africa. Um, and I, I've never looked at their gender ideology. Um, you know, patriarchy was obviously such a huge aspect of that culture. Yes. And similar cultures in the American South and everything else, but you know, racial hierarchies that were heavily influenced and, and patriarchy was such a key piece of it. Yeah. The 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 virginhood of white women was such a key aspect of resistance to um, integration of any sort. I just right. to play the role Um that that the way you're talking <laughs> to me describes the actual Afrikaner nationalist ideology, which was a right wing ideology for sure. So this ultra right neo-Nazi group that you're talking about that was even further right, um, I've never studied them. Um, yeah. yeah. But thanks for your question. That's an interesting one. I know people I can ask that, so I'll try to file that away. Yeah. Anyone else? Any other questions? Um, hi. Hi. Um, I had a question about um, when the ANC put out their abortion plan in 1996. You had mentioned before that there was under apartheid there was you know still a you know patriarchal attitude amongst like African men and that was kind of like pushing them like anti-abortion. And so I was wondering like once the ANC got into power, was there still a lot of like argument within the party over the topic of abortion? Like does that did that stall? in any sort of way between like 1994 and 1996? Like how did they progress from that? Or was it maybe less of an issue? Maybe it was no longer needed for like the cause or something once they were out of apartheid, but I don't know. That is a brilliant question. And it's such a great story. And I, I know people that were there. Um, it was an issue, absolutely. I mean, South Africa is a very religious country, predominantly Christian, conservative Christian. Um, and actually, most South Africans are not pro-choice. They do not believe on abortion on demand, for sure. Um, um, I think most South Africans would say there should be more than just the indication of to save a woman's life, but certainly not nearly as, nearly as liberal as the law that came into being. So that was really a case of a quite small group of incredibly dedicated, strategic, hardworking, forward-looking feminists that seize the moment because South Africa, when the ANC sort of, there was this really interesting liminal spate, this time from when they shifted from being a, 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 a political movement, a, um, a, you know, a liberation movement, to being a government. And through that transition, um, you know, the lines were really porous between the ANC, um, like, ANC members were, they did see themselves as a government in waiting for sure, and they be, were beginning to think about the laws that should come into place when they, when they were gonna win the election, as they, everyone knew they would. But they also still saw themselves as activists. Um, you know, there was a time there. And um, some of the women in the ANC um, were absolutely feminist. They had traveled or also well in exile. They had been in England, Canada. I remember people coming to UVic where I went to school. Uh, as an undergrad, so um, they uh, working with South African white lawyers, and um, I know a, a one woman, Marion Stevens, who was a midwife, who's white. Um, she worked for something called the Women's Health Project. Um, also, I think there were Canadian, you know, it was a really interesting story of, of um, getting it done and getting it done quickly because they knew that the opposition to abortion, if they waited too long, the forces would organize and um, stop it from coming into being. So they very quickly put in, they pushed, um, they have two very powerful women uh, who go on to be ministers, black African women in the ANC, um, working with white 
feminist lawyers and women in, in the health movements, basically, to put in place um, a process of having some hearings on abortion. And long story short, it all happens pretty quickly, and they get a draft law that these feminists de devised um, through parliament. And the reason it gets to parliament is because Nelson Mandela whipped the vote. If he hadn't whipped the vote, the thinking is enough of the ANC MPs would have stayed away that it could have failed. Because the ANC, generally speaking, um, by the time they were in power, um, and even before they were in power, if you polled them, they were not interested in a liberal abortion law. So um, that was that really came down to Mandela insisting that you know what that means with the vote. You, if you want to stay a member of the party officially, you show up and vote the way the party tells you, kind of thing. So it's it's a very interesting story. It's a dramatic victory, and I can give you names of women who were there who've written about it. But they're also now writing about how we need to learn from that because it is a very heroic story, and it excited me when I was young. But now you see what's happening is the heroic nature of winning a fantastic law. What is it, you know, like there's that, but then there's the actual reality, right, of widespread poverty. Rural girls can't get to clinics, you know. Um, nurses or, or, and doctors, um, can, there's a conscientious clause in the abortion law. So a lot of them are opting out of performing abortions. And I've seen shocking documentaries. It's very well documented already, but I saw this documentary once of a young African girl, a, a reporter who went in with a hidden camera to s some public health clinic to ask how, about how she could get an abortion. And the abuse and slut shaming that she's exposed to, it was to demonstrate why black girls, especially, just avoid public health care, do not want abortions in the public system. So that's, you know, that's incredibly conservative ideas about gender. Then there's um, also with the transition, I mean, AIDS hit South Africa pretty well just as the transition happened. So a lot of the money for health care went to, to HIV and AIDS. And there's a lot of reasons, structural reasons, um, why abortion is not accessible, um, regardless of this fantastic heroic story by these feminists to get in place this, probably the world's most progressive abortion law. It is basically abortion on demand. You know, It's one of the most liberal abortion laws. So yeah, it's a great story. But at the end of the day, it's kind of like, OK, they've got the right in South Africa, but what's the right worth if, if you're too scared to put, present your body you know, to a medical system? if you can get to the hospital in the first place. Maybe we can take one last quick question. Oh my god, you share. Maybe I will share. Yeah. Uh, mine's, mine's actually going to be Together. quick. Yeah. OK. Um, my name is AJ. I work in the libraries. I'm going to ask you a library-related question. OK. <laughs> huh, that will be a new one. Yeah. I'm really curious about the, the sources that you are using. You're very excited about the documentaries and movies. And clearly, there's that side of things. But in terms of the written evidence that you've been using, what, what are the, some of the more exciting uh, places that uh, you draw some information, the unex unexpected exciting sources of information. Let me ask you that mm. so, so you don't have to explain all of the... All okay. Of the um, Supreme Court prosecutions of abortionists. That Dirk Crichton, this very prominent famous doctor that got convicted and destroyed, he was convicted in Supreme Court and only Supreme Court uh, trial transcripts trial, trial transcripts are actually kept in South Africa. Lower level courts, magistrates courts, and this killed me when I learned this. It's the same with inquests. Um, they're destroyed after seven years. So all that testimony and transcription of evidence, you know, when people are answering questions on the stand, that's lost to us. Um, at magistrates courts, inquests, like in Canada, I've done amazing work on abortion deaths in the 30s because of inquests into deaths where a lot of people are called forward by coroners to give evidence. None of that's available in South Africa. But Supreme Court trials, um, those transcripts and all of the evidence is kept permanently. So if you can find a doctor who was prosecuted in Supreme Court, then you're off to the races. And the, the Dirk Crichton one was so rich. That's where I found all this very detailed slut shaming of the white girls, you know. Uh, newspapers, um, South Africa, the National Party was so puritanical and so afraid of English culture, blah, 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 that they didn't even allow television until 76 or 77. So it had a rich 
paper, uh, newspaper culture, print culture. South Africa has, still has, um, but had a fantastic uh, print culture. So a lot of newspapers, black papers, white papers on the range of political spectrum, lots of discussion on abortion. And then novels to try to get at especially black girls. Um, Mir Miriam Makeba is one rare example of a black South African woman talking about it because there's much more coverage, as you can imagine, in autobiographies by white women, autobiographies I've used as well, um, who tell stories of having children out of wedlock and all. One's called um, The Other Side of Shame, which tells you a lot, you know, that's by a white woman. But to try to get a black girl's experiences, novels. I found a fantastic novel called Dancing in the Dust, by uh, Kagiso Molope, who grew up in a township just outside Pretoria, where she remembers um, teenage girls talking about abortion and little vials of little green liquids that they didn't know really what they were, but if you ingested, could provoke a miscarriage. And the other novel I really relied on, oh, there's a very famous South African short story writer. Do you know Zoe Wickham? She's a very famous colored um, writer who writes about colored experience and she has an amazing short story of, um, of a colored young woman who has an illegal abortion in Cape Town, I want to say in the 80s, by a white abortionist and just how sordid it is and awful an experience. So I cite novels and short stories like that to get at first person accounts by black girls and women. And then I put in footnotes that I contacted the writers, I asked them, because you know that's also a little bit interesting. How much do you rely on fiction when you're a historian? I have one friend who relies on fiction heavily and does not have a problem with it. But for me, I'm like, well, is this based on what? You know. So Zoe Wickham said she knew uh, of someone that had this abortion. Kagisu Molepe, who, who I've met, same thing. So um, that's why I felt comfortable to rely on stories like them. And you'll see, I do have footnotes where I say that. I did contact them and they said, you know, something like that this happened. Yeah, so those, those are the ones that immediately come to mind. So uh, I'm Chris, I realize we're out of time, so I'll oh. try to ask it as a yes or no. Oh, I could no. talk about this oh, all night. You can tell, right? A, yeah. Yes <laughs> uh, so uh, it's a, I'm a historian, I'm interested in transnational things, and you talk about the transnational movements for choice. I'm wondering if the, the National Party, as they're devising the 1975 law, understand themselves to be part of an emerging anti-choice sort of movement, or if there is you know, a pro-life movement over the course of the 70s or 80s, because we know that the apartheid government was cultivating relations with right-wing Americans over that whole, whole time period. So I'm just sort of wondering about that. Um, I don't think so. I think the Afrikaner nationalists that were running the National Party for so long, they were very inward looking, literally, um, and on a lot, a lot of levels, very reliant on Dutch Reformed Church theology. Um, that's how they justified. If you look at all of their commissions of inquiry and select committees, blah, 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 you know, they're interviewing a lot of priests, Dutch Reformed Church ministers. Um, that's really the, that's the mother load of their ideology on gender, sex, abortion. But now South, in South Africa, it's massive. The Christian right is huge in South Africa, across Africa actually, both on ho promoting homophobic law and anti-abortion um, sentiment in law. It's a massive problem. I just had a conference at Penn State where two speakers from South Africa went, kind of went on about that, about the United States, the Christian right, and how it's a huge problem um, on the continent. You know, they have so much money and they're setting up supposed, you know, advice clinics and, you know, stuff you'll all know about here. But yeah, so there's a lot of transnational organizing, I'm going to say in the last decade, and it's getting worse, I think. Yeah, so that's a big problem. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> we would like to thank you so much for being here. Oh, thank you for inviting me. Oh.